Today we're reviewing Mortal Kombat Legacy, Season 1. Mm. <sighs> <laughs> this is what we've come to. Two episodes in, we're reduced to just grunts to express our opinions. Yeah, I reckon you, you, I reckon you open the episode like that, just like... Mortal Kombat Legacy was originally supposed to be a movie. I think that really shows through. It's not... It, it doesn't have a, th a really good through line across the series. Each episode is either a one or two part just looking at one or two characters and their origins. The whole thing is structured essentially as the backstory opening cinematic in the video game if you're about to start a campaign for one character. Starts off showing you why they got into the tournament. Season 2 deals with the tournament itself. Which, I, by the way, is remarkably confusing if you're just watching the web series yeah. as a casual viewer who doesn't play the game. Mm. That's the really biggest thing about this, is that it has zero carryover value to the uh, general public. I actually think the, the spirit that the series is meant to be taken in is, like you say, as backstory cinematics for each exactly. character. And yeah. it would be more suited to being a part of a video game rather oh, than absolutely. a standalone web series. Season 1 does not have an ending. Mm. That's the worst thing about it. Yeah. It does not end with any indication that A, it's ended, or mm. B, that it's just a prequel to the actual tournament itself. Mm. It just comes to a stop. Mm. So the cast for Mortal Kombat Legacy is pretty amazing. It features Tamo Pettikett from uh, Battlestar Galactic. I think he played Carl Agathon, from what I remember. Uh, Jerry Ryan from Star Trek Voyager. And then obviously um, Michael J. White completely wasted every single character. Mm. They're directed and the show is shaped in such a way and the casting is done in such a manner that they come across as washed up TV action stars, mm. which is really insulting because I think oh, yeah. all three of them are actually really good actors. They are. Mm. I also felt insulted for the actors because of the material they had to mm. work with and the level that they have to come down to. Although there is one great scene and it's fairly great, but it is highly enjoyable. First episode... Michael J. White and Tamo Pennekit. Michael J. White has a slightly worse line, and he's just he looks at Tamo and he says, "Fuck protocol," <laughs> and then he walks off. And uh, Tamo Pennekit just delivers this one line fantastically. He's mm. just like, "Fuck it, let's go." And from right from that little point, I'm like, "Yeah, fuck it, <laughs> let's just enjoy this for what it is." And then they go and have this awful fight scene. And I'm like, "Oh, that was a great line. You had me there. You had me for a second. Yeah, yeah, if you don't care about the person throwing the punch, it's you, you need time. a reason for these people to fight that's compelling. Mm. And the fighting isn't good enough to be compelling in and of itself. And the characterization is just not there, mm. as you say. Mm. There's yeah. no depth to it. It's yeah. just two people introduced who are supposed to, we're told, are amazing, and then have them fight each other. Yeah, Kevin Tankeron does have a disadvantage of having a really poor script. Um, but that said, he hasn't been able to get anything out of his actors at all he it's hasn't right. got his personality is not there True. the director is not present in the work if that right. makes sense right. it is structured entirely on cliches that's why there's no through line because it's a cliche mm. everything about it is a cliche the entire production only makes the safe choices yeah if you don't take risks you're not going to create something extraordinary yeah so mm -hmm. there's going to be nothing unique or interesting about it mm. because there is no risk when we see the sixth episode which is which begins with a disclaimer, this is my take on the Mortal Kombat mm. universe. It's yeah. a, a, a I think if realistic and gritty style mixed with some mysticism. If he and had I been think, presented with that same amount of freedom for the entire series... Yeah, that's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. If we see that, and we see that's his vision. How much of the rest of the series is, due, is down to producer intervention? Exactly. It's a disclaimer to say this is not necessarily a representation of brand. Mm -hmm. it, this is his own personal take. And it's one of the strongest episodes of the entire series. So the impression I got was that this is something he felt so strongly about that he actually fought his producers on and said, this is something I really want to do with this character. Interfere as much as you want with the rest of the stuff, and I want to make this the way I want to make it. A stronger director with a stronger vision, mm. with more creative freedom, would have challenged the material, mm. which is what would have made it a more interesting Ma and engaging series. But yeah, this, the, obviously the, the producers have so much control over the franchise mm. and they want to control how it's represented and seen by people. Mm. The show is really overlit. That's the other thing. Mm. I found it hard to get it out of my head that on the edge of the camera there's a light shining on the actor's face. I became very very aware mm. of that right. and that's 
that's just poor lighting full stop I think the cinematography reflects the main problem with the series which is that it's technically over competent overproduced yeah. it's like they do everything cinematography wise correctly mm. but it reeks of artifice it's not realistic it's not naturalistic at all it's mm. It's just highly different. stylized. It is highly stylized, but not yeah. in a, a grounded way. In terms of lighting, Scorpion Sub Zero episode, it's outdoor for the most part. Most of it is white because it's a snowy area. I don't think the lighting was. The lighting of the cinematography was inappropriate in there. Mm. The thing with that episode, with the Scorpion episode, <clears> is <throat> that, yeah, it's snowy and everything's white, but they. In post, they bring down the white level so that it's more grayish in, mm. in tonality than just white, which is what it should be. And this is something we have in Quest Academy mm. because we didn't have the right equipment to control the light as well as I would have liked to. Mm. They've had this, the resources to create something as, as highly produced as they have been doing and then they fail in a way that they have to correct for which makes it look worse mm. than if they had just left the mistake in. The costuming thing was for the first okay. episode was weird I... because Tamer Pinnacle should have been wearing a jumpsuit if he was actually going to go into the action. Well, and it would a, have a, removed a wind, a wind the confusion. Breaker, a windbreaker in a flat jacket. It would have removed the confusion. Though, yeah, he had to uh, he had to go from the meeting to his wardrobe, change outfits, <laughs> and then go to the fight. fuck it. Let's go. Five mm. minutes to change. <laughs> <laughs> but that is that is a good point. I've completely forgotten. The costuming. Mm. I want to go on record as saying I really liked the costuming. Mm. They managed to do something that very few things can do, and that's take a fictional costume that's drawn or uh, designed in such a way that it's not meant to be real. Mm. And they brought it to real life and made it look good. That's something a lot of movies cannot do, something almost no TV show can do. Mm. But they managed to take someone like Scorpion and have him not look ridiculous in mm. costume. Uh, so I'm going to keep it short and simple for this because I haven't got much to say really. Mm -hmm. uh, the writing is non-existent and therefore does not warrant anything more than one star. Um, the directing is... It's competent in a music video kind of way. Mm. <laughs> so I'm going to give that two stars but it's not extraordinary. So it's two stars out of five. Uh, and then the cinematography... Uh, that's Again, that's another two stars. It's, it's competent... Um, but makes some very serious blunders in certain areas. Uh, and I think all of those combine to create something which is just really ordinary. It's not ordinary in the sense that it's laughably bad and you watch it, you hate watch it for that reason. It's not bad enough to be that. Mm. And it's, it's not just boring. Yeah, yeah, it's just boring and it's not good enough to be watchable. Yeah. In, in a rewarding sense mm. um, and so I, that's, that comes to 5 out of 15, 1 out of 3 whatever you want to call it mm -hmm. just a disappointing experience that gets a slightly higher rating than usual because it does have enough strong production values and each episode does have a nicely developed self-contained world to justify the episode's existence so it, it succeeds on those aspects but everything else fails for me Casting and acting, aside from the first episode where they actually got real actors who are really good, but then wasted them with bad acting. And then only used them for two episodes. Yes, but only used them for two episodes. <laughs> I'll, I'll give them a fail on both of those because of the rest of the series and the way they acted in the first two episodes. Writing, I'm going to give a fail. And directing and editing, I'm going to give a fail as well because of all the points that you said. And again, overall, would I or would I not watch this again? No. Never again will I watch this. I barely watched it a third time. I just had it on <laughs> while I was doing other work. Yeah, so this series is primarily for the fans. Otherwise, it's not engaging because it doesn't challenge the source material enough. So that's our take on Mortal Kombat Legacy Season 1. We'll put a link in the description below if you want to watch it. Says the man who watched it three times. No.